un. Okay, everyone, it's Gordon Einstein, your resident Dubai crypto and blockchain attorney, uh, continuing our series of high impact, fast moving interviews with awesome people. Uh, this time, I would like to introduce Akina Ho. Akina, am I saying that correctly? Am I doing a good job? That is correct. You got hey, it, Gordon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, who is a fabulous and wonderful female tech entrepreneur and community builder. We're going to be going into what she's, what Akin is working on now, of course, and her background and how everything connects because it, it obviously does. Uh, I would like to thank Layla Herstel for this interview or for this connection. Um, I asked for, you know, top tier female speakers in the space and she gave me the short list of the best. So, Akina, you, you come highly recommended. It's nice to meet you, and welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can't wait. It, it'll be good. So, the usual format, like I explained before, is like 30 seconds or 10 to 50, 30 seconds about what you're working on now, just to give a little teaser. We will come back to that at length, and then we're going to go into your background and everything else. So, what's your passion now? What are you working on now? My main thing that I'm working on right now is on Hostile Women DAO. It's a uh, investment DAO, going to be an investment DAO. We've been building the community for the past two years that supports female entrepreneur uh, in Web3 and Gen AI space or men who support female entrepreneur, uh, you know, in the same space. Okay, fantastic. I, that was a very good headline form of it. Okay, so let's roll back. Where are you from? Actually, I was uh, born in Vietnam, grew up in the States. So I've been in the States for up to right after college for a few years. Mm -hmm. Then I moved to Hong Kong about 18 years ago. Yes. So I'm, I'm I'm still here. I love Hong Kong. It's one of the best cities, especially for Web3 and mm -hmm. Gen AI space, uh, if you really want to target the Asian market. And are you in Hong Kong right now as we're talking? Yep, in Hong Kong right now. You know what? That's cool. You're the first guest on the show who's actually been situated in Hong Kong when I've been speaking with them. So we're we're broadening our horizon, which is nice. Okay, cool. Um. So what what did you... What did you study and where? Because you, oh. if I heard correctly, it was Vietnam, United States, Hong Kong. Where, where, where's your... Yeah. So I grew up in the States, right? After I was born, I was shipped off to the U.S. because, you know, uh, the, the, the the economy and everything else, politics okay. in Vietnam was not great. And I went to UCLA for my undergrad. Okay. I was an actually English major with a minor in business administration because I you can't really find a job being an English major. So the yes. minor mentioning is to get me the job. <laughs> Okay. And then I went to a rival school for my executive MBA, which is USD. So for those you're who play the law school, so that's okay. Yeah, so you understand. So people are like, what the hell? You're a Bruin. Why are you going to the Trojans? So it's yeah, a, so that's my background. I'm, I'm, I'm a Trojan law school guy. So it's, oh, okay. oh, wait, we still have some blood in us. Yeah. So yeah, and people are really curious a lot of time. Like, how do you get here? Right. And I because it's I, I really believe and I know if those who watch Forrest Gump, like it's a box of chocolate. You never know what you can get. And, and the most important thing, you just need to reach out and grab it, you know, whatever you want, you mm -hmm. know, and, and until you grab it, you don't know what it is. Good point. I, I like it. OK. And then what 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 prompted your what did you did you, did you work in Los, in Los Angeles at all or did you go straight to Hong Kong after graduating? Oh, okay. So actually, you never know. When I graduated, I always want to work with the top four consultancy firm, right? Accenture, sure. PwC, and all that stuff. It never happened, right? So uh, they want a certain pedigree. I didn't have it at that time. So I worked for an enterprise rent a car, right? A lot of people, what the hell? You want to do something? You want to work or wash cars and stuff and rent cars? But they taught me the basic uh, skills in marketing and sales, built in rapport okay. with customer. One of the best training company ever, if you really want to know about marketing and sales. Then I went into the fintech world, which is Charles Schwab at that time in late 1990. So that yeah. was a disruption to the that time, uh, the stock market. Because that time, you have to have at least, a lot of young kids don't know these days, when you want to trade stock, you have to have at least a 40 million US. And you have to go to JP Morgan or Merrill Lynch to open an account. And you have to go to a broker to buy the stock. You can't go online now and click, click, click and buy something. Yes. And Charles yeah. was that fintech company that developed an internet that allows you to open a $2,000 account and buy stocks with it. If you can buy cheap stocks with it, you know, and then, you know, and you can call in and ask for quotes and you can find quotes online. So that's how I kind of got involved with the tech world without a tech background. Mm -hmm. um, because I know about FinTech, I was hired um, 
by a lot of Silicon Valley startups to help build technology related to fintech, the first one, right? So uh, it was called Outcome.com. They built that time really, really innovative, a SaaS model technology platform to host and outsource uh, accounts and online payments and also uh, online stock brokerage. Mm -hmm. They sold it to the likes of, you know, banks, Bank of America, Standard Charter, all that stuff, and all and all Merrill Lynch and Morgan Stanley too, but they got the business model wrong. Banks and 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 major financial institutions do not want to outsource the client information, right. so they actually took down the startup and sold the technology platform to these banks so they can build it. We wrap the whole infrastructure to allow online banking and online account management. So okay. you know, yeah. So that was interesting. And then from there, I went to another two startup. Each one got a little bigger, then I learned why startup fail and why startup worked. Mm -hmm. And then I started my own consulting company to work for, um, you know, like founders, help them. One of them actually helped them. It's a boba uh, milkshake uh, shop, you know, from two store. Now they're actually a public company in the U.S. They are also shipping medical supplies. It's called Lottie Cup of Carrot. Amazing yeah, story. Milkshake shop? Yeah. Have you ever tried those boba milkshake? Uh, like, yeah, it's uh, a yeah, yeah, I love it. Tea, right? They call it, you know. Okay. You can imagine it can become a public company in the U.S. So they're the largest in the world right now. So and then from there, I would help the company does construction materials design and became fifth in the United States for that service. You know, they have marble manufacturing firm in China, mm -hmm. things like that. And then uh, left, and then went into uh go to Hong Kong. From scratch, with no job, no friends, nothing starting from scratch. Okay, well, you're, just... you're, I'm sure you're skipping something. You know, you, <laughs> you, you didn't throw a dart on a map. You right. chose it for a reason. So what happened? Right. So just that I just thought that at that time, at the very early age, at early, you know, I'm going to give my age away, late 20s, early 30s, I felt like I kind of like reached my max. I wasn't going anywhere. I was working, you know, I was having a company. I was, you know, like uh, helping company like growing uh, double or triple the revenue in one year after mm -hmm. hiring me. I just felt like I wanted something else. And then I, at that time, there were predictions that uh, Hong Kong was the gateway to China. At that time, China has an oldest oh, early 2000 day. And China's going to be opening up, but they will use Hong Kong as a gateway to the West, right? And, and there was uh, 50 years of... One country, two systems, which yeah, right. So and then and I wanted to go to Hong Kong. I want to be there when, and see what happened, and see how China is going to use Hong Kong and how Hong Kong will pivot to become part of China. Mm -hmm. I want to be there. And I, I think opportunities will be there. I think there's a lot of pent up uh, talent requirements. So I just packed my bag right after stars and flew over to Hong Kong and put, find an apartment and start partying and meeting friends and Good finding jobs. And, yeah. And then just from there and just went to a lot of jobs I'd never done before. I went for a telecom company, uh, worked for a friend for nine months, helped him deploy uh, from tech, uh, trunk technology to IDEN, which is a digital walkie-talkie technology, right? And then from there, I went to uh, FTS, which is a uh, software selling into hotels to digitize their operations. Sorry, sorry, let me stop you for a second because you actually, you actually said a, a good nugget in there that I wanted to focus in on. Okay. Did you have connections or network that pre-existed in Hong Kong kind of waiting nope. for you or did you go from scratch? I worked from scratch. I had no friends, no apartment, nothing. I just booked in advance. I didn't even know through a friend. Mm -hmm. uh, not a friend. Oh, my friend's staff went to uh, stay at their place. No friends. And I, oh, my friend was my 60-year-old auntie. So she picked me up at the airport and then uh, showed me around town, opened my first bank account. Wow. Uh, you know. I, I, I like this story. So I, I think it'd be good for the people watching. How do you, as a new arrival in Hong Kong, I guess having never lived there before, even if you visited before, and yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to... Actually, do you speak Chinese? Yes, I speak fluent Cantonese and Mandarin. And, and, so, and, okay, so, and, and Hong Kong is Cantonese, right? Yes, Hong Kong is Cantonese. Okay, that brought, I'm, I'm going to guess that helps. But yeah. okay, so are you, if you don't mind, are you a Chinese background Vietnamese? Is that the? Oh no, no, my parents are both 
uh, my mom is okay. Well, I, I'm still trying to figure out where my mom. There's a there's a because uh, both my parents passed, so like no one can verify the story because I heard a different story from my mom and dad. My okay. mom said she's from China and she went to Vietnam, and I'm hearing from my sister. No, my mom was actually born in Vietnam. So I'm like that's not what my mom told me. So, but then my dad is definitely from Guangzhou, you know, and he uh, went to Vietnam and he you know to do business, and then he well it's not to do business, but he was kidnapped when he was really young during the um the Japanese China War. Yes. So he was kidnapped by the Japanese and they brought him to Vietnam as a, a servant and an indentured servant to the prime minister after a few rotation. He mm-hmm. worked for them and then grew up there. And after the Japanese was defeated and had to force to leave Vietnam, he, le- he left, he stayed in Vietnam to build his business. So he kind of started his business from scratch. So he become, you know, he has hotels, he has shipping and everything like that. It's nice. amazing. And he, us, the most important thing about in anyone's life is education. Because that is something you can, no one can take away from you, right? So if yes. you have basic education and you are hardworking and you have honesty, you can make anything out of your life, right? So these are the basic. You know what? You're inspiring me. I'm I'm, I'm getting I'm getting some oh, dopamine okay. going around in my body right now. This is a great story. So did did, did you yes. did you speak Chinese at home growing up? Yes. So my dad, though we grew up. We, I was born in Vietnam. We went to the U.S. He made sure all of our our six siblings. There's oh, six of us, right? I'm number two, so I have five other siblings. He made all of us, though we hated it, because after you know American school, I think we get off about two or three. Mm-hmm. Everybody wanted to go out and have fun, right, with their friends and stuff. But we were forced to go to Chinese school. We had to, we had to go to six year of a Chinese school. And it's really intense. Mm-hmm. And you know, the, the Chinese school, the principal actually stand at the door and greet everybody by the name. She knows every single student from grade one to grade six, right? Okay. And then it's it's like each class is about 30, 40 people. And you had to learn how to ink, you know, do with your ink brush writing, the small yeah. one and the big one. She do all the, how to read and write. It, it's amazing. I would never give up for that, but I was a horrible student. My dad would always yell at me because I'm always number two from the bottom up, right? Oh. He's like, how can you be so, so smart in English school and then so bad in Chinese school because I keep skipping school because I didn't want to, to go to school, I wanted to go hang out with my friends, right? But I, I, I'm glad I picked up something and it's still there. I can still read. Well, I mean, I God, God bless your dad for or yes, your parents. Him. He's I mean, a seriously. great man. Yes. He, because he went through something that none of us want to go through, right? He was kidnapped when he was, uh, I think, was four, right? So during wartime in China, there was curfew. So he was really short. My dad's really short because I'm really tiny for those who met me, I'm very tiny. So my dad is really tiny too. So mm-hmm. that time, I think he was seven and his brother was four. So he was number three, his brother who was like number six or seven. I think mm-hmm. there was 12 of them. There was, uh, when the Japanese were taking over uh, China, there's curfew. You can't go out after eight o'clock or something like that, but they were, there was no food. So people were like starving. So because my dad and his younger brother were the youngest and still know a little bit, they can sneak out at night and then hopefully go undetected to go find food and bring it home. So one night they both went out and never came back. So imagine the parents, right, waiting for them. I heard that my grandmother cried every day waiting for them and just cried until her eyes went blind and, of course, died. But we, we were lucky we saw our grandfather. Mm-hmm. He was just, he's a man of my God joy. At his age, he's still singing and and, and, and talking stories. He loved that. And my father inherited that, even though they have never been. They look so much alike. It's so amazing how uh, genetics, is, it, it works, it's a miracle. They're yeah. so alive. My father singing and love telling story, but he, they left each other since he was seven, right? So it just carried in. They looked very alike. There's no mistake in you see them. Right? There must be parents, right? Like father and son, right? So because of that hardship, my father taught me how to read and write by reading newspaper that he found on the floor in Vietnam. Every day he picked up a Chinese uh, paper that people discard on the floor and he asked him, what's this word? And he taught himself one by one by one. So when he made it... So I, 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 well, I saying, let me get this straight. So your right. your dad during World War II was very young. He went out yeah. and broke curfew because he needed to get food for the family. He got right. picked up by the Japanese, I guess, the Kuomintang. And they, they ship yeah. him off to Vietnam, which at that time was a, okay, by, the, by the Japanese. He's a kid. He doesn't have language skills yet because I think he said he's like seven years old or something. So he's picking up newspapers from the floor 
and basically yes. scavenging information from friendly. Yeah, for people walking by. Yeah, so my father taught I, us. I hope you appreciate that he sent you to Chinese school. Yes, I do. Now I do. I love that. I am so glad that all of our brother and sister uh, love that. At that time, yes. you didn't, right? You hated it. So why did I have to go to Chinese? He has a hidden, right? So when we like like play hooky, we get caught because the principal called. Your daughter didn't show up, right? So it was, but when you're young, you don't know these things, what, what parents can do for you that are meant for, for your own good. You only know it after the fact. If not, I wouldn't be so valuable in the professional world because I can read and write Chinese and then I can speak fluently Cantonese and Mandarin because I know how to speak Cantonese and learn Mandarin. Well, actually, right? let, let me ask you about that. So you, did you say your dad was from Guangdong near China? Or... Uh, he was uh, Guangzhou. Yeah, Kong, uh, Guangzhou. Guangzhou, okay. Guangzhou, China. Okay, and, and that is a Cantonese dialect, yes? That is the Cantonese dialect. So how did he, how did you guys pick up Mandarin? So I watch TV because okay. I can read Chinese. So then it's easy. So like when in the olden days, in the olden days when we watch TV, it's mainly the movie comes from Taiwan. It didn't come yeah. from China. Because China at that time didn't have a movie. It was Taiwan. And then Taiwan, that they speak Mandarin. And at the bottom, that's the, right? And then and Taiwan subtitle is traditional Cantonese. Okay. It's not it's not simplified Chinese from China. So I learned to read uh, traditional Chinese, even though the dialogue when I speak it is Cantonese, it's not Mandarin. Right? The word is the same, right? So then therefore I can read it, so I can learn this uh, the words really well. And I think I just have an ear for speaking Mandarin. I picked it up really well. I have the accent too. <laughs> so people thought it was. This is epic. Okay. Now now we're. I feel like this can be a two-hour show, but I want I want to keep it on. So <laughs> you, you you arrive in Hong Kong now. So this is an important detail. You don't really have a social network, but you have fantastic language skills because you're fluent in English, obviously, and you have both yeah, varieties of Chinese. I hope my English is fluent right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think so. So no, I mean, you, you, that's what I meant. You, you had American style English, and you had you know domestic native, whatever you want to call it, varieties of Chinese, both dialects or both yeah. registers, however you want to say it. So, okay, yeah. but you don't have a network. So tell us, yeah. what, what did you do? How did you build your network in Hong Kong? Oh my God, I went out, I met, I went, oh, internet. So in that time, Hong Kong is such a vibrant city. There's, every night there are parties uh, thrown by different expat, like there's an MIT and stuff like that. And and so then I met also a friend that happened to be in Hong Kong. So we kind of roomed together, you know, after I've been here for six months by myself. He said, oh, so you're you're in Hong Kong too, let's room together. And then she was going to get, she was getting her MBA. And then she was, uh, and then she was sent to Hong Kong for a, um, like, uh, for a project or something like that. So okay. she was still at school. At, oh, she was sent to Hong Kong UST. So she met a bunch of students who had friends. So I started hanging out with them. I think because it also has to do with my personality that I wanted to meet people. I want to go out and meet. I don't, I don't know. Who, I, didn't, I didn't care who. I just wanted to meet. So I, I meet very local Hong Kong people. I meet people who were educated from, who were born in Hong Kong, grew up in Hong Kong, went out for education, came back. And of course, I met people who are from all the part of the world, came to Hong Kong, expat, really expat. Mm -hmm. So just meeting these people and going to all the different events and parties and stuff like that. I, I even like two two years in a row, I had my pictures on Tatler, right? Because I went to those private parties. And you know, I got myself into those private clubs. I was a member. So I would go to party a lot, like by Fong. I was in I was in the in crowd, let's put it this way. So I was really lucky. Mm -hmm. Kind of just built to my network from scratch. And then I right. think my personality, being open, uh, being generous, you know, and then um being kind and being a very curious mind to say, Oh, what's going on? Like, what do you do? You know, of course, you meet some bad people, but I, I, I'm, I think I'm a little bit more positive. Just going to always just get them out of the way. You know, you learn your lesson, just move on, right? So, yeah, if sure. you you know make one mistake, you know it's okay. Two mistakes came on you. The mistake, how stupid you are, right? So you try to try to feel off the bad apple. So, but it's part of growing too, right? Because I, when I came to Hong Kong, my father was a little bit afraid, saying that I would die in Hong Kong because Hong Kong is known as the crouching tiger of the world. Yeah, like, you know, if you watch Tiger, Hidden Dragon movie. So that's the word they use to describe Hong Kong. It's a very small place, but all the talents and amazing people and companies are here. 
right? Mm -hmm. And then what there's fast the coaching. What, what, what was that word? It's called Coaching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Have you saw that movie before from Michelle yeah, Yeoh? Yes, yes, yes. So it's actually a term, right? And then um, that means that all the, like, you can't tell who's who. There's a lot of wealthy and smart people that don't look like they're smart and wealthy, but they really are powerful people hidden okay. in this city. So, you know, the thing I didn't think I was alive because I'm more sheltered, you know, where a little bit more, think that the word is very simple, you know, but I've learned. And one thing I think I'm very glad, and this is something I I, I had to talk with my uh, last corporate boss, you know, his name is Alex Lowe, amazing man, very smart. Told him that I've seen a lot, been through a lot, but I don't want to change who I am. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us need to sometimes take time to think about that. A journey might change who we are when yes. we are, we are, are too hard, when we're still genuinely nice, genuinely care about people, do things that are right. You know, it's not just about uh, commercials, it's not just being fake to get to know somebody or get someone's money. You know what I mean? Sometimes it means more than that. You know, it's hard. I'm not saying easy. I'm still struggling every day. Try to retain that. That parody that I think I still have, I hope I still have, mm -hmm. and then do what I think is right, you know. So it's tough, but hey. So, uh, sorry, how long have you been in, in Hong Kong? 18 years. Wow. And it, has it been continuous? Continuous, never left. I love Hong Kong. It's an amazing city. Amazing, amazing okay. city. And then the, let's lead into what, what, what I, I understand your fintech background, I understand your marketing background. What was your first? real exposure to blockchain, crypto, and sort of the philosophies behind it. Okay, so the first, you know, I heard of like gold mining, my friend wanted to go in. Of course, you're like, ah, I don't believe in that really early on. But the first one that I really understand how uh, tokenization of asset came in place was in eight, 2019. Okay. Or 2008, sorry, 2018. I met a founder, a very smart woman, and her name is Lam. And then um, she basically were trying to tokenize uh, real estate assets. She built a platform guide with Kai. Okay, so remember, I love the concept that was so smart, how you can take one building, like even a house in the United States, you can, mm -hmm. multiple people can buy it and the rental from it, everybody share, right? But you don't have to take out a quarter million or a half a million to buy a house. You put in the 20,000, you still get an income, you know, things like that. So that was amazing. That's when I really serious look into it. At that time, I think Ethereum was only like three bucks US. I wish I listened to her and bought a lot. <laughs> but instead, I got carried away by the business model and the tech instead of buying the damn token. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. So that's what my very special first into the Web3 world, um, you know, in 2018. That, that, that's interesting. That, that's actually, compared to a lot of people I speak to, relatively late, to be honest. Because most yeah. of the ones on the show were like, you know, 2009, 2012, 2014, yeah. maybe. Uh, right. So yeah. you, you've I, arrived I never had a big it. splash. Yeah. So, I mean, I heard about it before, right? But you just didn't think it, you didn't take it seriously, you know? You had okay. Bitcoin, of course, you should buy it. Bitcoin was at 500 when I wanted to open a wallet to buy it, you know? But it was so difficult. It took me 45 minutes and I still couldn't get the wallet to work. I just gave up, I right? Know. But imagine yeah, I, I know this feeling, actually. I, so I imagine if it did buy it, I don't know how long that was, 500 with Bitcoin was $500 a, a token. Imagine, right? So I was like, okay, I'll put 5,000 in there and play with it and see, right? But didn't do it. Oh, uh, well. See, that's why I don't believe that life is all based on faith. You're not ne ne not meant to be. It's not meant to be. So, yeah. But then that we not really realize, hey, there is something there. The tech is real. It's not just a token floating around that people are just going to gamble on, right? So that's when I start looking at it. And then start looking at um, business models uh, related to blockchain, reading case studies, stories about it. And then actually try to build. Then I realized that by, you know, even before metaverse became a hot word, right? I think it was in uh, 2000 or 2019, late when Meta changed, Facebook changed its name to Meta. Then everybody would kind of know what Meta was. I wanted to build. It, it feels slightly more recent, but I could be wrong because what happens in Dubai yeah. is everything seems to be right. now. Right. Yeah, because the reason I, the date is like uh, there is because I wanted to build. At that time, I was saying to I was working for a very traditional real estate company. Mm -hmm. I told them that because this is an amazing part. I have a very smart chairman, right? His name is Dr. O. Uh, the Eagle. He's really smart. He's like, Kina, can you build a new business for me okay. that has 
e-commerce like Taobao, a membership like Amazon Prime, Tender hooking people up at a higher end, Soho okay. House without the house, but with all the experience, Airbnb, but peer-to-peer booking and stuff, and in a Pokemon Go, the gamification pieces and the blockchain components. And I'm like, okay, sure, let me go find a business that has all that, right? And then uh, that no one else is doing already. So I kind of um, thought of, I found a, a business that doesn't exist. I have my team research and then we came up with a concept of the company we call is Wisdom of Living. It's basically a, now I'm going to tell you, so if you understand, I stopped pitching this as 2019. It's a 3D e-commerce marketplace for experiences. Okay. They're like, huh? So they were like, what do you mean by 3D? So I was trying to explain that time. I said, well, Facebook is 2D and, you know, uh, IG is 2D. You know, it's not 3D. 3D because I'm a gamer. I play games every day, two, three hours, right? And mm-hmm. it's like a community, there's a team, there's people around the world. We, we, you know, we have all kind of stuff well, together. What are so you kind of understand. Uh, Empire and Puzzle. Okay. Very dead fan. So I spent a lot of money on it. <laughs> I'm, a cheap, I'm a cheap gamer too. But they teach me a lot how you get money from people. So, and then we both, we launched the business during COVID. So it took us a while. No one believed it that it worked. But my boss, Alec Blow, was really smart. He said, you know what, Kina, I don't understand what you're building. I don't understand. Like, I don't get it. I don't know. I don't know what it means. But I trust you. Here's the money. You know, that this is all you get. So make it work. So we did it. We launched it during COVID. And then in the first three months, we grew 59% month in month in revenue organically with no marketing funding and with a team that has a full-time job that we're doing this of a passion right and then we have to stop selling because we built it on a very small budget it was like one month of my salary or something like that and then uh, we launched it in five months and then because everything in the back end was like nano because <laughs> it was just built a fun layer because it was like come on no one understood what we were trying but so we have to show people but the business keep coming we stopped selling after three months and the revenue was still growing Mm-hmm. organically and after six months we're still growing 46 percent a month in revenue right this isn't revenue i'm not talking user okay so then but then i mean like, that ends up huge numbers pretty quickly yeah well, so, well even if you smart even if you start from a very low base i mean you yeah. keep under 50 percent per month it's it's, it's it's a very short period yeah. of time until you get into real real numbers yeah i know so we didn't and remember when you're in a real estate conglomerate real estate makes big money Right. So the board's looking at this. Well, this is a peanuts. Right. But you have to understand when you're starting a, a, a startup and with no funding, no full time staff dedicated to it, it's a passion project. It's going to be small. Like you have to remember Apple, when Steve, thought, Steve Jobs started Apple, he was, his annual revenue was only 46,000 mm-hmm. per year. If you look at that, no one wants to invest in it because it's the potential. Right. You have to have real money to grow mm-hmm. a business. You can't grow a business without real money. It's That's hard. what I was start up, right? Uh, you know, even no matter how great or how shitty your product is, you have money to throw at it, you have smart people around it, you will make something out of it, right? But if you have great tech and you don't have money, you can still die. I know a lot of companies out there that died in that great tech, great idea. Never worked because no money was behind it, you know? You just can't survive, you know? So, well, yeah. What, so what eventually happened with it? So you know, we were looking for investors, but we wanted to roll it out because it, it doesn't fit in with the corporate, right? So if anybody read the book called Innovator's Dilemma, yes. you kind of, you, yes, you read it. So you didn't you get it, right? They didn't get it. They're like, oh, this is not all core. We don't understand it. What are we going to So, yeah. So I went out and um, found investors, uh, three investors, value at 30 million US dollars. Mm-hmm. And we're willing to roll it out. And then when we got the investor, then, you know, the board were, wow, I didn't know it was worth that of money. Let's internalize it. But that's not what, you know, we communicated. So we know some different strategies. So I understand it. And then realize, oh, you know, like I have so much passion for Web3, right? Then then I'm like, you know what? Maybe this is a sign. I should go out and really learn what Web3 is. And that time, Metaverse is already out. And the piece is like big shot. Everything is hot. So mm-hmm. that's like, you know, so I'm like, here, take back. And then let me go out and. And kind of like, you know, really get into the Web3 world. And then when I met Layla, before I left. So I, then, I, maybe we discussed it at the beginning, before we started recording. But just, just to recap, we're talking about Layla Herstal, the, the one who introduced us. I think it's good for the audience, especially for the woman in the audience. How did you meet? So basically, I wanted to learn more about Web3. And the only way at that time during COVID is to go to webinars. 
Yes. Right. So there was a Remember webinar that. that was talking about, you know, I forgot who it was. I think the um, host was Sharad, right? He's the okay. founder of MetaShaper. I'm sure you know who he is if you're in Dubai. Yep. So anyway, he was hosting Layla and a bunch of people. There were like eight speakers, right? The one that stood out was Layla. She was telling me about Ostal with the the concept she had, and how she wants to build an investment DAO. Because I'm because I was also on the investment committee at Great Eagle. So I was like reviewing a lot of startups and then doing due, due diligence and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. I know how difficult and how hard and how narrow a VC can be. So she was saying that like now everybody can vote, the member can vote, funding comes from the members. It was such a good concept and I understand blockchain, right? Because I've been studying it ever since 2018. So all on a DeFi platform, you know, using it to manage, you know, governance and using it to manage treasury and everybody votes on it. Totally get that. So then I reached out to her I said, can we talk? I'm very interested in the idea. Can you tell me more? And so she did. And we hit it off. She's a very smart and passionate uh, young lady. And then, um, right, smart like hell. And we kind of hit it off. Mm -hmm. And then uh, she was still in school. And then, like, you know, and then we kind of just built it from there. Very cool. Wow. Yeah. I, I like how everything connects up. And I met her. I want to say about a year and a half ago, because a friend or a colleague of mine, Ian Arden of Mempool Ventures, did a event in Abu Dhabi, and then uh -huh. we he set it up so we were all in like this big limo heading out from Dubai to Abu Dhabi, you know, bonding, nice. bonding and eating McDonald's, and she was, <laughs> you know, she and I started chit chatting, and she, she's very clever, and it was a, it was a good conversation. We just kind of stayed in touch, and then, you know, it's fun, it's funny how one thing leads to another. That's great. That's super. So your your current project and your current passion. Let's talk about that. Building also women. I was the first Asian uh, person, or right? the first person from Asia to join mm -hmm. also women. That when Layla started, I think we had like sixty people or something like that. Now it's just, we call it ambassador WhatsApp group. People who really believed in uh, what we're doing and who wants to uh, push it out and be mm -hmm. part of it, right? Not just a follower, really active, right? So. She brought in a lot of great people, and I get I joined. And then uh, so as we built out, we started getting people who really interested want to build this together. So then I, I built a chapter framework, like what a chapter does, you okay. know, how to do from scratch. Is it a geographic so based chapter, or is it like a, a functional chapter? So it's a functional chapter within a city because we believe that you know there's only so much you can do on a WhatsApp group. But if you really wanted to support female entrepreneurs, because I understand how startup is for entrepreneurs, especially for at that time, Web3 actually encouraged a lot of individual uh, creators to be their own boss, right? So they come out to be the, you don't need to be a company, you can be a self-employed person and then offer your skill and work, right, through multiple companies. So this was the kind of idea, is to empower creators. So then I realized we can't support people on the website. We have to support them in other ways. So I set up an office in Hong Kong and we launched events and then we uh, with self-funded, right? With, with my uh, co-chapter leader, my, my chapter leader in Hong Kong, you know, like she was the very, my, she was my second member in Hong Kong, right? I was the first and she was second in Asia, actually. So yeah. we kind of did a first event and thanks to James Kwan from Jumpstart, uh, you know, and then we, he sponsored the venue for us, right? And we bought food and all alcohol, very nice prime real estate in Hong Kong, great view and everything. And we wanted to do a 30, 40 people that was in, in July of 2022. And you know how young Hong Kong was at that time. Right. A theme of that talk was, what is Web3? And we were expecting 30 people to show up and we'll be happy, right? Like we had over 100 people register and then 70 something people showed up. We thought that we were going to be in crisis, right? And then we basically found three uh, speakers, three people who's actually built in DeFi platform or mm. pro a metaverse platform. And then share their experiences. So a lot of like events we go to, they always hire the big shop, right? No one gives the little people time. If you're working, if you're starting out and you're, and you're, you're building a company, you're not going to be a big shop. But who gives these people a stage? Right? Not a lot of people do that. I, so I, we wanna you do. Do. I do. Exactly. So all the events we do, 90% mm -hmm. of speakers are people who's actually built in something, right? They're not big shops at all. So and they, have to, I think you're implying they're reasonably new or newbie builders. Their first or second dance. Is, is, yes. I think I'm hearing that. Yes? Yes. Okay. Yes. 
can be the first or second dance, but they're building something and they're new in the space and they, they, they're they not big enough for anyone to bring them on the major stage, right? So yes. I bring them. So I built stages for them. Not only that, I hooked them up with lawyers and stuff to give free consultation, right? To help them. I help them with the investment deck. I, I link them to investors if I think they're good enough, right? So it's mm-hmm. all free. So then we help build a lot of people's career, right? Launching them, building them, connecting them. And we have a lot of people that actually real businesses because we provided them that launch, right? We continue to do that. And first we have what is Web3. And in November, 2022, we had another big event. We had over 140 people sign up, 110 people showed up. We only wanted like 70, 80, because last one was 70, 80. So it was always the same. Oversold, overbooked, with beautiful view. Thanks mm-hmm. to Victoria 22 and the friends. It gave us a very good space, ocean view and everything like that, free drinks, free wine, everything. We never charged for any of our events. And of course, then we this time we bought, because we wanted to prove why Hong Kong is the hub for Web3. That was the thing. We mm. picked three people who were actually supporting the well, One was the Hong Kong government. Second was a guy who's built in, um, who was the uh, ex-CEO of South China Morning Post, a well-established news, uh, newspaper, right? I, I read Kong. it. That's interesting. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, he left to build a Web3 crypto company. Mm -hmm. So, like, someone leaving a corporate job is so well meant to start from scratch. Why did he want to pick Hong Kong? Why? So, I want him to tell the story and why he took the leap, right? So, a lot of people thought he was crazy. Such a cozy, powerful job. You control the media, right? Mm -hmm. Then, why are you going to start a a, a small crypto, you know, NFT company? And then the third was was, uh, one of the Google advisors that provides uh, free money and free technical technical support for startups. So come to Google and they give you all this free stuff. So we want him to share that, right? Mm-hmm. So that was nice. That's a totally different than the, the following year in 2023 last year. We, we, I realized there's a gap between parents and child. A lot of children are already in the Web3 space in gaming. They understand crypto. They're using real money buying, like, sure. you know, like Roblox, right? That's that's crypto in, in another sense, right? It's tokens, right? But it's just Web two. Right? I, I think it was a precursor to. Sorry, to interrupt. It, it, I think two things developed in parallel. I think there was the Satoshi's of the world working on crypto and blockchain, but w- very much at the same time or before there was this parallel World of Warcraft world where they where you developed that's- an economy when you did this, that was massive and the moment you could begin to get this, this these currency or these items like you know a sword or a yeah. shield outside the game you kind of had a it was a virtual currency maybe it wasn't a cryptocurrency but it definitely was a yeah. virtual currency and the two yeah. are they're, they're not totally separate yeah. they overlap in some concepts yeah yeah you know, yeah. It, yeah. It, yeah right yeah so like i always tell parents your kid who's playing games and spending your real money to buying whatever thing they buy virtually they're actually it are involved in the metaverse concept and in the NFT concept and in the crypto concept, right? It's a concept. It, they may mm-hmm. not be technology-wise the same thing as a token, but it's the same thing, same concept. It's a it's a it's a virtual currency for them in the game. They use to buy things, right? When they switch with real money to buying tokens, I do that every day, so I know. So and then and I know parents want the kids to understand what they use, but then they don't know how because the corporate parents you know oh this is the the, the new generation. But they don't know how to bridge it. So we did a, a charity uh, event whereby we actually, uh, for free, train uh, pa- uh, train parents and kids from age eight and sixteen. Mm-hmm. What is blockchain, a digital art, and NFT? And we met those art, and two weeks later, we launched it in a gallery set where the children sell the NFT. One hundred percent of the profit is donated to a nonprofit organization in Hong Kong called Principal Chan, which provides. Mm-hmm educational support for underprivileged family, which average income is about 600 US dollars a month. So in the, in, in, that is very underprivileged, right? So for, for, for kids who grow up in such a, a family, there is no support for education at all. The parents don't have time to talk to you because they're both are working or, you know, know, they just can't. So then-, well, then just, like, just so I understand, Hong Kong is, I understand that the one child per family policy has been drastically modified recently. Did that ever apply to Hong Kong or was Hong Kong its own? No. So you you, you still have the little princelings where they get the attention, but the parents are working, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So like in Hong Kong, like if you're born in a well-to-do family, you're lucky. You have maids, sure. you have everything, you can pick up everything. You have chauffeurs and stuff like that. 
But if you're born underprivileged in a family that's like struggling with five hundred, six hundred dollars US a month, you're basically living in a two, three hundred square feet home right, okay. with a family of three to four or five people. And then uh, you basically have parents both working day and night, right? Sure. And or, or, or only maybe one parent's working, right? Or like, you know, so it's it's really tough, right? And kids, they don't have no place to do the homework. They have no uh, money to t ask for tutors, right? Which a lot of wealthy kids will get, right? So like, you know, so it was amazing. The, the fact is that we want to teach kids about how to sell things. Because when they get older, when they graduate from 8 to 16, generative AI will take away most of the job. Okay. Yes. What what they what they are left with is here, and here the ability to uh, uh, articulate what they're selling, what they're talking about, the ideas it has to translate. And then right now, a lot of education, especially in Asian uh, schools, they don't teach them about uh, how to be an orator, how to communicate, how to how to articulate things, how to sell things, how to present things. That's in the Western more concentrated skills, right? In Asia, it's all about Math, writing, things like that, right? So it's all that. So we're trying to change things. Yeah. So, and then when they start selling, we saw the, the transformation of the kids at the mm -hmm. workshop when they're learning, they're so tired of the same thing. But when they're actually forced to sell, because it's their arts and their parents' arts. So the parents just sat there watching, the parents not selling anything. So the kids are running around selling and asking people, can you buy my art? And say, like, how can you turn down a kid, right? Especially when they're eight or nine or 10, right? So, oh, you tell me what it is. And, so uh, and other devs also tell me what oh which one is your art right and what why are you paint a donut why do you paint a unicorn they explain and then they and we still have the you know, and that energizer rabbit right in front of our eye running around and the parents like is that my kid you gotta be kidding me right so they didn't recognize the kids off this they turned them into Wait, let's say, let's say, this is this is awesome I'm I'm just watching the clock here tell me about female empowerment with the Dow right okay so. I mean, like we did that because we wanted to empower, especially moms and their kids, right, to be in that world. We did that, and so we, a lot of women we support, uh, like entrepreneur. We support men too. That you know, like we have about seventy percent of our ambassador group. Our ambassador group is about eight hundred, close to eight hundred people worldwide now. Ambassador okay. group about six percent C level executive, you know, creators, investors, entrepreneurs, right? Forty percent are senior management, young professional, and both Web 2 and Web 3 that wants to learn about the Web 2 and Gen AI world. And then 70% are women, 30% are men. So any woman that wants to you know, uh, ask for advice, we're open for men and women. We support them. They have a career, we launch them. And, he, and then we put women on stage of global summit, like for recently, a WOW Summit. Mm -hmm. uh, the organizer is an ambassador, Bowie Lau, right? So she is an amazing woman. She supports, she always put women on, on the stage and she will work really closely with me to curate to see which woman we want to put on. We try to put woman on there that's smart, has something to say, but not necessarily has a big fancy title. We okay. try to do that. So we, it, 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 there's a fine line because it is still a commercialized event and do that, right? So like recently, uh, upcoming in uh, April 6th, I work with Hashpi uh, and they co-organize um, a, a big event. It's called the Web3 Festival in Hong Kong. Okay. It's, it drives 50,000 people to that event. Huge, that's, right? That's huge, and, right? Yes. And then and if you look at the, the name of the company, most of them are big. All of them are big company names. And I think about 90% are men, right? So then uh, I work with them to put a whole panel, just women. I, I don't normally do this, but because I wanted to promote women, right? So I've found three women that's from different part of the world. One from Silicon Valley. She's a little bit more mature. And I, I found a, a startup founder. She's a woman from Singapore and then one from Hong Kong. Actually, one at Taiwan coming, but due to some conflict of interest, she couldn't come. Mm -hmm. If not, we would have like four speakers from four parts of the world tell, talking about how we survive in Trump in the Web3 AI. Like how, do, how do we make it? And then these are very small companies, right? They're not big, right? So no one really knows them. But now this is the major state of 50,000 people say it's huge. Right. So like they're going to have a spot now. Yeah, you know, I actually wrote that on LinkedIn. Right now they have a spot to talk about the company. I, I, so, I, think, I think I saw your post, actually. I was looking through yeah. your profile before the conversation. Yeah. Is, so, uh, is your organization a DAO? We're, we're building our DAO. Right now we have a community. We have not launched our investment DAO yet. And then in the okay. DAO space, 
lot of DAOs do not launch their actual DAO on the DeFi platform until the community is mature and strong. Because if you launch your DAO on a DeFi platform without a strong community, you would die. There's basic three things to make a DAO successful. I've I looked at so many DAOs in the past, like those hundreds of million raised or whatever, to crash and stuff. Mm-hmm. Number one, you have to have a very strong community, right? Number two, the, having a purpose is it's given, right? That's that's a, a given thing. You have to have a very strong community that believes in that purpose. Mm-hmm. You must have a very stable and secure DeFi platform. We're not building our own, so we're safe at that. We're going to use someone else's. That is, that's their main job, right? So I, And number three is that you must have a very strong governance on voting and treasury management. Which will be defined in your white paper really well. This, this that is, should be by the smart chain, by the smart chain, uh, smart contract on the DeFi platform. I think, I think, I think I haven't heard anyone say this before, but it's I, I, I love what you're saying, and, and if I may share why. Um, okay. Like sure. I, I'm very much behind the DAO idea. One of the reasons I went into this area of law was I found it ridiculous that every jurisdiction has to say a different corporate form, especially in the United States. You know, you have a California company, you have a Nevada company, you have a Delaware company, and the fact that they're all different and you have to qualify in different jurisdictions seems designed to make the lawyers, the regulators, and the accountants happy, but, you know, doesn't actually facilitate commerce. Okay. And so I've always posited the idea of having a global, you know, distributed, having a on-blockchain company or you know, you can or corporate form, and for whether it's for profit or for nonprofit, and and governing yourself in a smart contract or algorithmic manner. But what I've seen in reality is all these DAO startup without the community. It's like they put the cart before the horse. They worry about their smart contracts. They worry about their you know their fine tuning their algorithm and governance and everything else. But they, but it all it always goes awry. Or it yeah. seems to always go awry because the people, you know, aren't working together. They're anonymous and incented and looking for flaws and trying to, you know, get a win in yeah. or something. I, I think yeah. it's, and I've never, I haven't seen one really work, to be honest, yeah. in, in, in a continuous way. And, and I like what you're saying. You know, I guess it's, I guess it's kind of obvious, but no one ever said it, which is yeah. you build the community first, you establish your norms, and and then you transfer items of that onto a reliable blockchain exactly. yeah 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 the people don't see, yeah the people don't see that the d5 platform is allow you to scale and to be transparent and to be accountable personally and professionally right but then if you don't have a group of people that believes in the same thing and wants to make this happen it's never going to happen because you have the tech but you don't have the people it doesn't work and you know and then another thing you're so smart and you, you, you got it right I, I always tell people the United States going backward. They don't understand DAO. They don't want to understand DAO, right? Their focus is totally wrong. Having a Delaware, you know, and in a Wyoming on 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 legal uh, in the regulation of DAO set up, what they do is basically take a Web two company and wrap around it. It creates, like you said, more money for the lawyer, more money for the accountant. That's it, and it doesn't help the DAO. The reason why people want to set up DAO is because supposedly this is how I explain to a lot of people. They want to take away all the bureaucratic stuff. They want to take away all the cost behind it. If you, you know, like in, in, in our court and corporate world, our traditional way of setting up proper nonprofit is a triangle. You have a person in top and they tell you what to do and you hire all these people to escalate the, 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 the duties downward, right? That's why you have accounting, you have a marketing manager, you have an operation manager, you have a receptionist. Before you even build a business, you have all these costs you have to pay. A lot of these young students or young creators and young business people who understand the DAO concept, they want to start a business and do something without all that cost. How do you do it? Sure. It's possible, right? So a DAO is actually a circle. It's flat. Everybody in it share the same responsibility and share the same idea and share the same profit, not just the cost. So that's the value of, of, uh, of let, 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 let me argue with you slightly and feel free to argue back. Okay, sure. I, I'd say that blockchain technology allows for the kind of flat hierarchy you're talking about or the equal distribution you're talking about but it's not mandatory there's there's nothing that doesn't say you can't have specialization of functions in DAOs or people have more more governance or less governance but but i think the key is it's a choice and it's a choice that's allowed to you that isn't otherwise allowed to you with a traditional legal form 
That, that is correct. That's why so, I love it. You can kind of roll your own. Yeah. Yes, that's it. So how you run your DAO and what your legal structure or your regulation or your governance structure is based on your own community. You guys come up with it. And you write that in the white paper, basically outlays almost like prospectus when you, before you join, you know, put yes. your money into a mutual fund or anything like that. It's outlining how you're going to vote, how you take my people's money, how you're going to distribute the money, and how you're going to take the money out. But I think that is a fair legal requirement, right, for any company that takes people's money and, and invest in it. So I, I was involved in the uh, UK and Wales Law Commission uh, exercise where they actually bought a bunch of lawyers and layer one developed all around the world and the country to come up with laws for them to regulate DAOs in the UK and Wales. So, and the basic concept that so far that the consensus is that you cannot call yourself a DAO if you have no intention of being a DAO in the near term, right? You can't take 20 years to become a DAO. You can like, they want you to become a DAO within a certain amount of years, right? What is that a year? They have not come up with it. So because, so this is to get away from people trying to use the word DAO to trick people, to defraud yes. people, right? Second thing, you must have a white paper that clearly defines what you're doing, uh, how you take people's money, how you unwrap or plan people, how do you vote? It must be very really clearly defined. So when I go into your third requirement is on the DeFi platform, I know exactly what the DeFi platform should do because it should follow the mandate of your white paper. So when you want to do audit, you can know, you can know for sure that you won't have like an FTX issue, an Alameda issue, where there's hanky panky. So what if whatever you wrote on your white paper is actually infected technically on the Free Five platform. So they're not going to do anything that's not stipulated. And you think you can always vote, change things definitely. You can alter and change as you grow, as you you, you, you you pivot or you know evolve, right? Definitely, that's the freedom of mm -hmm. the community. So anybody can raise their hand and say, "I think we're going the wrong way. We should vote on this." Definitely can. It depends on how the regulation, the governance is written. But the DeFi platform should be. We said that it should be a third party platform. If a DAO wants to build their own DeFi platform, there should be two separate scrutiny and audit, right? To make sure, because then, you know, you can't trust that the. I'm sorry, you said, that, that you said this was a working group in England with attorneys from England and Wales that. Actually, it was the UK and Law Commission that had a, a, a call for evidence exercise, which they invite people who are in the DAO community who's built in D5 or from who are lawyers to work on this exercise and you kind of read what the single team and then what are some of the recommendations you can understand what the by reading the questions and their and their mm -hmm. their the structure you can kind of see what they're moving for but it's like they can is nothing is approved yet nothing is firm but the consensus of the discussion is like we think these are the basic four requirements you have and the last one you must have a community inside your DAO. Right. I, think have in the, in the, I think in the show notes to this, when we post it on YouTube and LinkedIn, we we need to have a link to Innovators Dilemma. We need, <laughs> need, to, need to have a link to your organization. We need yeah. to have a link to LinkedIn, and we need to have a link to this working group if we can find it. Because I don't it, think, yeah, I don't think it will exist anymore because it's a government tender thingy that they ah. come out, uh, right? And then they, they take away once it's done, they close it. So it's like a but you, I you're, write you're, you're actually raising a real couple of cool ideas that I haven't thought about. You know, see, it's good to it's good to talk to people. Like you know, the, yeah. the idea of maybe having an ISO standard for a DAO, you know, or you know, an ISO nine thousand dash DAO something or other. Yeah. So, you can, so you can to have, to have a standardized approach because the I think the tendency of the people who did this from a technical and software development angle is. They're like, why do we need a white paper? The the smart contract is the white paper in yeah, a way. You mean. There's there's an okay argument for that. I kind of get what they're saying, but yeah. you're, you're you're maybe doing it from a little bit of, or there or you or they are doing it a little bit more from a social emergent angle, which yeah. Though especially if you're dealing with people that's not a developer, how are you going to explain? Like for me, seriously, you tell me to book audit a smart contract. I don't even know how to do it because I'm not a developer. And if I don't understand, I'm not going to put money in that. I'm not going to trust people. So a lot of time right now, most DAOs are protocol DAOs. So all the technical people. So a lot of people who built in protocol DAOs are all smart contracts. Sure, you look at the smart contract, you can see what we're building. That's different, right? But then what about the other types of DAOs? That where the majority of the user are non-technical people. You have to talk in their language. 
much. You can't tell them to go look at smart contracts. They wouldn't understand at all. So, and if you're building like a nonprofit organization or you're building an investment DAO or you want to build a like, you know, collective DAO to like fundraise money to buy the constitution or buy a football club, majority of your investors are not developers, I'm assure you. And you tell them to go look at the smart contract, like how the hell you need to write in English or Chinese, I don't care, in normal language to let me know how you're going to do this. So that's what the white paper is, right? Just basically outlining what you're going to be doing. So people trust you. And then like, you know, and then we did talk to DMCC in Dubai, actually, like me and Leila did about two years ago. And they're like, you know what? We have no regulations on DAO right now. We do issue DAO licenses. We would love it if, that's why we're in, and we're building right now. Really? It's safe. Sorry to interrupt. ADGM has DLT foundations now. Oh, really? Okay, that's good. That's you two might want to revisit the topic. Okay. That's great. Or did definitely do. That, right. Great. And so a lot of the thing has changed and evolved, right? And then um yeah, so a lot of countries are still not ready to come up with regulation. So when we did that um UK and Wales law call for evidence, it was January two thousand and twenty three. So that's over a year. And it's still not out. So that's mean that whatever has been recommended or what we put together, all the consensus. They have still not finalized what the law right. is, right? It's uh, and even Hong Kong, right? Even though Hong Kong has uh, set up regulations for virtual assets last year June, mm -hmm. but it has but it's mainly just for a crypto exchange. But then in the Web three space, there's more than just exchange, right? There's a lot of DeFi, GameFi, oh my god, and NFTs and all that stuff, and then you have you know all the DAO. They're not even there yet, so we're at a very infancy stage for DAOs. And there will be people that I know are like DAOs been around for at least five, six years, right? I think I, I Googled and in uh, May of 2023, I think there's only like 19,000 DAOs or something like that. But then I remember Google something else and some another site told me that mm -hmm. there is like a 5,000 DAO with a trillion dollar under asset management. So sometimes you don't know who's real. So hey, oh well. But at least one thing that everybody agree is still very early on and no country has come out with, you know, a, a clear statement or guideline of what DAOs are and how to be regulated. And that reminds me, I don't know, I think you're old enough to remember this. I'm old, I'm old enough to remember everything. <laughs> <laughs> so I was talking to a 26 year old girl and so she, uh, just earlier and she didn't show, oh, I didn't know that. So it was interesting. When the internet first, out, first came out and e-commerce launched, right? I, in the United States, I remember it. it took them five years for the U.S. government to come up with clear concept and guidelines and taxation you had to tax company and sell yeah. things online. So, like, it took them five years, right, to, to, to go taxation, how the technology should be built to, 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 to track these data. There's a so real issue that Amazon exploited for a long time about whether or not yeah. state sales tax would apply to Amazon transactions. Yeah. You know, exactly. So, where does the sale take place exactly? You know, exactly. And you remember that, yes. So, okay. so, yeah, we'll be like this for a while until someone built a very successful case that's actual that they can't be ignored. So we can't stop ignore this, right? We have to come up regulation to manage it to protect the retail investors or the retail user or customer, right? And then, and then, and then, and then, of course, and after that will be how do we get benefit out of that? How do we tax the hell out of them, right? <laughs> so this is where I have the conflict of interest with mm -hmm. the concept of being taxed for DAOs. Is that the whole purpose of the DAO is that you, you like the, the whole concept of being on the on using cryptocurrency and DeFi properties is that it's supposed to be decentralized. We're not supposed to be taxed. <laughs> We're Ideally. not supposed to be the government. I tell the US government that. See how that goes. Okay, so it's not going to happen, but I'm saying that how do we overcome that? Because the whole idea of the blockchain is to decentralize, no central government. The whole idea of having cryptocurrency is that now just normal me and you can create currency of our own without government approval, right? Because if everybody loves a Kina, I have a Kina coin, and everybody buys a Kina coin, that's the coin we will use to transact, right? That's crypto. You know? So we're actually disrupting a lot of things that are in place. And how do we? I can't wait to see the mergence, right, of the two. What is the, 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 the I don't know, compromise? Where do we compromise? 
right? How with, with all these things that is disrupting things. Like, you know, NFT is disrupting how ownerships are tracked, yes. right? We don't need a lawyer now to tell us that we own a property. We just trade NFT and that's my house and that's your house, right? And we don't need a, a title company in the U.S. You need to hire a lawyer and a title company and a deed company to buy a house and sell a house. The three companies you have to pay. So if I have an NFT and I just trade with you, forget all those people. You own my NFT, you own my house, right? Uh, that's, I, I'm with you. That's, that's actually why I'm practicing this area of law because I, I want to reform law to reflect the technology. I think it's better for the world. That's um, amazing, you know. You're seeing a lot of interesting things. You, the, the, the tax point is interesting. I, you know, one way to maybe think about that is we kind of pay taxes now by paying the, the transaction fees when we when we conduct business in crypto. I, I wonder. But that the, the transaction fee doesn't go to the government. It goes well, to the company. Thing, right? You know, it, we're, we're getting to like what is the government? You know, yes. is the government right. the protocol? Is the government the, this thing sitting in Washington D.C. that you know doesn't really own the internet anymore? It's like. Yeah, so the, yeah, when we talk about governance, so what the government body does is protection, right? Uh, put the police in place, making sure they have lights and water and all that stuff, making sure there's order, right? There's no chaos. So they have to get paid somehow, but how do we pay them? If we all move to all these central, I'm just saying in the future, I don't know how long, how do they get their share of the money so they can operate and protect us, right? So, you know, or set governance for us, uh, whatever they do. <laughs> I got, I, I got yeah. it. I, it's a, I think there, there's an issue of how do we fund government when things are virtual and untraceable, and then there's the issue yeah. of our governments even doing their job. And right, well, let's not touch that. <laughs> right, okay. right. Sorry, yeah. just, just I, I want to. Unfortunately, we have to wrap it up because I've got we've gone triple the normal time because you're awesome. Yeah. How do you see your woman's organization growing in the future? What, what's your plan for the next one two years? So where hopefully this year we'll be able to work with the lawyers and regulation. And like I said, the law is not clear. We want and actually told on stage in the WOW Summit with the Hong Kong government that we want to be the pusher. Because I'm glad they said it. They want innovation before regulation. So they want someone to build out something and then push them to say, oh, wow, now we can regulate. It's like, okay, I'm going to do that. I'm going to I'm gonna launch my investment DAO, though yeah. there's no regulation on investment DAO. Right, that's crowdfunding in a bit. And do I need a security, a, a license, or a type nine, or whatever it is? I don't know. I'm gonna do it, but just don't put me in jail for it. <laughs> she said, "Okay." You, you're, she like the, the boy, you're the perfect client. Yeah, yes. I said, it, and, I, and I told her too. I said that no, she doesn't have power over it. We were just joking that we're good friends too, right? I said, if our star woman launch the investment DAO successful, and people investing, we're investing, we have a project that we can invest in. Mm. And we show the world that, hey, I'm not going to go to jail because I want something like this. Other DAOs will come because there's clarity that they can push the law a bit when there's 100%. no regulation. So I said, you need one successful case or two, right? And big enough because we're global. So our impact is huge. If we're successful, this travel the news goes around the world, right? And, um, you know, and that would be a big significant. That's what I would hope to do. I don't know where it will be happening. Because there's still so many moving parts. Hey, you'll, you'll, you'll do it. I, I, I have faith. You, you seem like a dynamo. So that's cool. <laughs> I hope so. You no, go no. to regular school and then learn Chinese and then go to Hong Kong and then do this. You got it. You got it. I we're we're going to so. actually like maybe check in with you in a year and you can tell okay. us how successful you were. Hopefully. Yes. Hopefully I have good news for you. But I would love for you to join our Australian Women uh, the Ambassador Group. I would add you on WhatsApp. Sounds like my kind of thing. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you so right. much. Right. For we we gotta just spend the time, but you, you're you're amazing, and we'll put all your contact information in the show notes. And I think Thanks. this is very exciting, and I'm I'm happy to have our first you know Hong Kong guest on. And you know what what a wonderful illustrious example you are. You know I'm, oh, I'm feeling kind of jazzed up. So this is great. I'm gonna stop the recording. Okay. Thanks everyone okay. for watching.